C'est bien. Marhaba Badira from Drôme, France. Hi, Aslima, Aslima, Shirin. Ou Anna Beirut. Et tu es Beirut, Aslima, Shirin, mais Beirut. Je dis toujours, uh, I always say where we're calling from because it's amazing to have this incredible network of musicians uh, communicating all over the world about very similar ideas. You know, I feel that a lot of people are thinking about the same themes and topics right now. And certainly your work really influenced um, Hia so much. And actually you designed, you, we, we, you, you allowed us to um, use your wonderful track that I still love so much for the <laughs> second edition of the festival. And oh, that cool. was um, a dub à la turque. Yes. <laughs> stunning, stunning track. Um, that channeled the mood for the second edition because the first edition, it was uh, Liliane Shlela's uh, sort of really loud, uh, noisy techno music yeah. because it was right after the Beirut blast. Oh, so yeah. the first edition had much more noise and the second edition, we wanted it to have like a more mystical you know, healing. Yeah. yeah. You know, that song is, is actually a Turkish folk song, but I, but not the intro, obviously, but, you know, Muhabbat. And it was a, a Turkish friend in London when I used to live in London who, who taught me it. And I, I liked it. I love it. Stunning. And you sing it so beautifully. But I love the intro, yeah. like, more than the song, actually. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. I prefer uh, the intro, but I don't know. How did I you think... make the intro? How did you uh, think about it? I was just improvising, like really with my internal microphone, like that song was recorded with internal microphone and then I kept putting layers on and enjoying it. And I think I wasn't, exp I, I didn't, but for any of, of my songs, actually, uh, I'm not thinking about, about it to be released or which form. In. So generally, I'm just like, I compose a structure how I do it in acoustic, and then I improvise. And when it first improvisation, when I'm really in a good mood, generally the first time is like the best time. Afterwards, it's never the same. So I learned to record always the first, the first draft, which became like all the album Kahram Musiqa. It's all drafts. <laughs> so, so alone, alone at home with your just your computer microphone. Yeah, a microphone, computer, and a guitar, and uh, and keyboard. Yeah, Beautiful. that was it. Mm. He... So I started by mentioning Lilian and then you because I noticed that in your music you actually go from those two moods. You go from the mm. noise and the rage, and the yeah. revolutionary um, anger yeah. to very meditative, contemplative um, sort of um, healing modes. And I wanted to ask, and I know that's also part of your character that you have. This, <laughs> You have the, the fire, you have the fire, you know, and you have, but you also have a very sort of wholesome uh, character. I, I mean, you live in the countryside right now. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, in the countryside, but it's it's quite, uh, I'd say, uh, very alive here. There is a beautiful scene. Like, there are so many festivals and illegal stuff, actually, <laughs> that happens in the mountains, in places where the valleys where, you, where police cannot hear us or hear about it. All concerts here. Uh, the communication is through texts. There is no Facebook, no events, no internet, you know. You receive a text to tell you that there are, if you are on their mailing, I mean, texting list. So that's how you, you get into the, I live here, you know. You, you get into those lists after six to a year, six months to a year. It's quite cool. But uh, yeah, but regarding this like anger and smooth, I, uh, I like the, this is kind of a joke, but it says before I, I used to be schizophrenic, 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 we say, yeah. now we are going very well. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm good. I know that I'm like all over the place. When I was in my twenties, many producers, people that I met, they were like, no, you have to, you know, like be in one direction, other, you have to dig the same hole otherwise you won't get to to being famous actually for them that's like success but uh, me and now i am very uh how to say that like not just proud but like very conscious of it that 
that's not my road and this is not what um, I, I started doing music for. I, I like communication I, and what, what also you said, therapy. For me, music is moments of grace of communication with the, the high, the something that's beyond me and us and everything and communicating that energy as, as therapy. And for that, I don't consider myself of having any merit. I've, uh, I think I was born with that or I learned very, very fast because actually there is something that doesn't depend on me. It wasn't like uh, 10 hours of work every day on piano, you know, when I was five. No, that didn't happen at all. <laughs> So I love that you're in tune, you're in tune with your own flow and you're also in tune with the flow of the universe with mm -hmm. what's going on around you, whether it was, the, you know, the revolution in Tunisia, whether it's the underground scenes, whether it's, yeah, what's going on musically and in, in various um, scenes that you're in dialogue with, you listen, you know, in such a deep way. And Thanks. I really love that about you. Thank you. <laughs> well. I don't know, I feel like, I hate it when people say, like sometimes I say stuff that doesn't please, especially after the revolution, years after the revolution, my leftist friends, and some of them will be like, oh, please don't talk about politics, stay in arts. And I'm like, bitch, sorry for the word, like, bitch. <laughs> I used to talk when, you, when you, you were just shutting your mouth, enjoying your privilege as actually someone who has real materialistic privilege, you don't come from my same neighborhood. I'm not talking out of ideologies. I don't care about your Karl Marx. I don't follow that, that stuff. I'm coming from my contextual knowledge and my own experience. And I'm talking about my people, people, my brothers, my family, my cousins, people who walk five kilometers to get to fucking factory, not to have actually enough money to feed their kids. So for me, the revolution is not about getting to join the first world and be and have freedom of speech no it to to have enough food for your kids to have social justice so not you having your inheritance from your father that probably stole it because you couldn't before the revolution you couldn't make real money if you were not with the regime if you're not if you're not into corruption so don't give me lessons at least that that stuff like especially after when there were the Islamists in Tunisia and you see how the whole left, their problem was like just ideology instead of working on, on, on the economic issues and attacking this right wing religious parties or political system uh, in, in the real, at the real mark, which is economically, you are completely lost. They have no vision. And for me, the, the, uh, the Road Tunisian Revolution was really uh, an, an anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist revolution because the last years before that, it was the real expansion, free market that started to have in contracts that were just like for, in, so we have foreign investors, so we have money in the country. We, and those foreign investors, they were putting my people to slavery for nothing. So for me, the revolution is quite clearly an anti-capitalist revolution. And that is why it, it, it has, it was a major issue for, for foreign countries. I also admit that, that also my left, not all of them, I wanna say my leftist, leftist friends, some of my leftist friends in Tunisia who are like, no, that's a conspiracy th theory that foreign countries are meddling with the, with Tunisian politics and Egyptian politics. No, it's not conspiracy theory. That wouldn't have been it. the fact that the Tunisian revolution and the Egyptian revolution weren't at all good news for those people. If those countries come to stand up and have real sover sovereignty and have real social justice, that would set a precedent that would make a lot of revolutions around the world that wouldn't allow those billionaires to make much more money for I don't know how many generations it's just like obscene and indecent like when you look into a squirrel can you imagine a squirrel who would like take so many nuts for like 300 years they would kill the fucker I used too many bad words I'm sorry
<laughs> they would it's kill fun. this. This, the, yeah. They would. I mean, this is a fun, make it's a sense. Punk, uh, punk conversation. So, yeah. tell me more about you know where you were when the revolution happened and how you organized and how music sort of um, came out of this moment for you. Mm. So, I, when the revolution in, in Tunisia happened, I was in London. I came, uh, went back to Tunisia on the 15th. So the 14th, the president uh, flew. Obviously, we, nobody was expecting it. So I, mean, I bought my ticket to be part of the protests. But I remember one friend of mine told me, no, but we'll come, come for the general strike on the 14th. But the ticket was more, more expensive. So I said, no, 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 just the day after is good. Anyway. And before that, the thing is the revolution is not just two weeks. Like I remember from 2010, we were talking about Cocotte, uh, Cocotte Minute, you know, you feel it like the, the, there were guys for, around the, the, the family of Ben Ali who would like go around Tunis with guns. That was the first thing, you know, guns on there. Nobody can stop them. They, if you're a girl in the street, they could take you from your boyfriend. It, it was becoming really like some type of mafia and uh 2008 actually there were like the revolts of of the mining region gafsa and there was like actually a media embargo i remember coming back from london and and showing my dad like uh videos of the protests and he was like what and they killed people and no tunisian heard about it youtube was censored you know at, at that point now people forgot all of that, forgot all the, you know, the fact that you didn't have any access to real, real info. So yeah, uh, 2000, me, I, uh, I played, I remember from, from 2008 to 2010, uh, I, I was, I, I couldn't play in Tunisia. I didn't, like the gigs were canceled all the time until we, we figured out that me and another artist to whom it, it kept happening, Bayram, uh, Bayram Kileni. So we figured out it was actually their way, but not, not frontal way to say, oh, you're forbidden, but it was their way to forbid all concerts. And you cannot have, cannot organize even the smallest concert in Tunisia without an authorization, at least from the police station next to you, the nearest police station. So that meant for me, like the revolution started really in January, 2008. And it went on for three years until that wave of anger reached. Like Gafsa and Sidi Bouzid is not is not far, but us, like artists and stuff, we we felt it. We I remember when festival there were like two cars, police cars, but like uh, secret service normal. I mean the secret services they had cars, not very secretive. And they put their cars next to, you know, like I was playing in the middle. So we are we have the stage here facing people and they have the cars two four by four facing the people. And it's like um, intimidating, you know, a moment. But uh, at least for me, I sang and I have the recording. My voice was trembling at the beginning, but and nothing happened apart from the fact that I couldn't play. I mean, the next concert, I played the concert and then there was cops outside asking people for their identity card and after that I couldn't play so I know that people from like 2006 to 2011 10 no when did I they kept uh, passing my music through USB so around 2010 something like that it was really funny to sometimes be on, on the beach or like when you go to cinema festival something like that and I'm playing and, and many people know the song and you're like uh what happened in a in why was I talking about this because I thought about the moment that I I, I think for me was uh key which is at this concert on the beach the festival with the two cars of the cops and I realized there were so many people and I realized that I gave them immunity because they don't have to say anything. I say it and they just clap or say, yeah, and they recognize each other. And they realize that there are many of them because what we uh, forgot in a dictatorship is that you don't trust anyone. You have the feeling that even walls have ears. When you're in the Metro, you, you don't talk about politics, you know, don't talk about the president, don't talk about the government. 
you can, they can just take you. There were so many informants when I was in uh, in university as well. So that feeling of giving them protection of recognizing that, and they gave me protection by being so many. The police couldn't take me that. I know there were so many young people completely, really angry, really. I know that if something happened to me that night, they would have burned the police cars. So I love that symbiotic kind of, you know, relationship. And it kept, I think, going on for many artists for this wave of, of, uh, of like, um, uh, challenging the limits of fear. That's for me how also the revolution started within the artistic or cultural milieu. So what were these songs about that you were singing and that they were circulating on the USB drives? I, I love that idea. It's amazing. <laughs> there, were, there, there wasn't other possibility, really. They knew they could not be on internet with my name. So that was cool. People kept telling me, oh, I have a USB key with your music. <laughs> Like mixtapes, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what were those songs about? Oh, uh, actually, all of them at, at that at that point they were all protest song, all social. In two thousand eight, this one there was the DST. The first the song where I told you was the first song I started with. It was about the kid that they killed two months before. So in June two thousand eight, they killed a, a boy who was seventeen years old like uh, real bullets were used. So they had the authorization of, you know, opening fire on protesters, but only in this area. So not, all Tunisians didn't hear about and hear that there were people killed. And this boy was the first one killed. His name was Hafnevi Marzevi. And so I made a song about him. Uh, and in the middle of it, it was talking about the family, like uh, Trabel Seya. I named the family of the wife of the president. Oh, were their palaces in Carthage, you know? and so that is also why, like, the, the the Tunisian cultural scene, especially theater, because they are the most left guys, but they talk all in riddles, like they are opposition, but it's all in riddles. And I was part of this generation, which were like, no, confrontation, go for it, say the the things. This is not a democracy. You cannot treat people like that. This is a police state. This family is, is corrupted. This family is trying to take all the money in Tunisia. Credits are being taken, are being asked for for the state, but then they are being taken by people, by some guys, some girls, some guys who are around the royal family of Tunisia at that point. And yeah. were you ever scared? I know you had couple yeah. of issues and your brother had issues as well yeah. so mm. tell me about I, that about dealing with that censorship uh, and fear there the actually my dad protected me from so many because they actually threatened my dad and i i, I knew that afterwards they they came because my dad is is a policeman he, he used to be but he was retired and they came to see him when i was uh Outside, I was in. I was in. I lived in London, and they told him, "You should tell your your girl to calm down, or we will stop your retirement salary." You know, he never told me that. My mom told me that after the revolution, and he actually told them, "You know, I she's she doesn't listen to me. I'm having big trouble with her. <laughs> really, I'm sorry, but I, she doesn't. She doesn't want to. I'm not talking to her, which wasn't true at all. If he told me that, I would be like." No, not my my family, you know, but so they didn't do anything. I think they really believed him. So that was fun, but uh, yeah. So the fear, I don't. I've never had fear for myself, really. When I'm in position, like when we were in protest and there are cops in front, like, and with with their guns, and there is a moment where I don't know something happened in my head or in my soul. And that small inch of of freedom in you and I am absolutely fearless but I remember also having nights where I, I kept throwing out throwing up out of fear really for my family when I heard things you know because also me in, in France actually someone told me called me on a number that I just bought when I came from London for Paris for staying two weeks 
and someone called me on that number and told me it's the Tunisian consulate and that I should count down. And I thought it was the brother of a friend of mine because he works at the consulate. So I was laughing. I was like, ha ha ha, nice prank, you know, and a nice prank. And he was like, and didn't say anything and he hung up. And so I called my friend. I was like, did you give my number to your, your brother or are you calling me to? And he was like, no. And he called his brother and came back to me and I was like, no. And so I remember that night I spent it really like shaking in my bed, waking up, throwing up, going back, trying to sleep, couldn't sleep the whole night. That was probably, I think, the, the worst night in my, in my life because my brother was also in prison and I was, an, I was super scared for what they could do to him, you know? That's also a strategy they generally do. He was in prison also because he was making music uh, yeah, but the, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was a smoker, but they don't really care about you being a smoker until there is something else with it, you know. So it's the reason. It's my dad used to be like, "Don't smoke and don't do that," because because he's a policeman. He was he was like, "They do that to to have another reason, so they don't have to be like we are liberticized, you know. We are we are." We are arresting you for because you talked about what's happening. We are arresting you because you are a, a, a drug addict. You are we, you are arresting you because you you've been drunk, uh, you know, on in the public area. Even though they they sell it, you know. So I know also of, of friends of opposition of real activists who who were they, they plant on them. So the police come, you know, talk to them, but then some, one of them is going to put some hash, hashish in their pocket. And then they'd be like, okay, let's go to the police station. And then they, you know, uh, they'd be like, ah, oh, so you're a smoker, good. There was like l l lawyer. I remember hearing about that story and, and you're like, we know that guy, that's impossible. He doesn't smoke. And well, I don't know, a few years after when he came out, and, because they, when they put over seven grams, you go for dealing. So you go five to seven wow. years. Yeah. And your brother was a rapper. Yeah. So and what the, happened? To my my brother, yeah, he was, he was actually like really much more fearless than me because he starts this concert by saying, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. I had a sound issue, but I, I don't I, worry. I, so, what was the brother <laughs> rapping about? It was all social. It was all talking about, you know, life at the there. How how guys how they grow up and not feel actually manly enough because they cannot really, uh, how to say that like have the dream of funding of, of founding a family of, of having decent work even if you do like you know good if you have a diploma good studies if you don't have what we call lectef you know you don't have connections you won't work that's that's a rule so yeah i told you he, he would you he would start his concert by saying i know there are some cups here if you are cool show yourself if you don't you know we won't change anything Fuck the cops, you know, fuck the police. And at each concert, they take him at the end and take him to the police station. Probably rough him up. He never told us, you know, I think they roughed him up a little, but he was released. And then there was a, a period where there was this guy, the rapper that used to live in, in Spain. He released a song under a pseudonym and it was really trash and it went really, it was popular in Tunis. And at that time, the police kind of gathered all rappers and had them record something to just like try to figure out who the rapper is. So they had like tests, vocal tests, casting, <laughs> audition for rappers. Yeah, it was really now I'm surrealistic times. Really like real dictatorship. Wow. All the pillars are, are there, you know. Yeah, such a violent, mm. a violent environment. 
So yeah. we were able to, you have, you have had always such strong connections with other artists, um, with mentors, um, you know, you had so many collaborations throughout your life and you continue mm -hmm. to really thrive on connections with your community. So despite, as you said, the lack of trust and the lack of safety, I feel that you're always able to find your people. So uh, maybe you want to share a little more about that. Uh, I think it's almost mystical how you find your people. It's like it feels. It's like love. Actually, it sometimes feel like all other. Like you have a lot of people. They feel like transparent. You know, there's people that you meet every now and then, and then like your tribe, you feel like you can see them. They are really there. You know, they're like they are full. You know, and it really. It, it never. It's never. It never happened on like a conversational grounds or like intellectual grounds it generally happens around the drink around you know like really a laugh at the beach or really i had so many encounters where before until like we felt like we we, we could be really friends we didn't know what we were doing each like we weren't talking about artistry and then obviously also and afterwards some even becoming a little more known and and, and meeting musicians from what we call the underground scene because sometimes it feels like it's an appellation for especially in the arabic world for actually some genre and and not not the the how music is created in in this kind of scene which is for me is an apologetic not you know not caring about the what the industry or what what what's expected of you to succeed but if you succeed you are mainstream you cannot it's not because you are rock bound that you're gonna call yourself underground if you are taking ten thousand grand a gig that's not possible you know if you have millions of views on you are you, you becoming maybe it's in the middle but you're touching already mainstream so this is to say that i met some artists that from outside you would say we are the same tribe and actually no not at all like it's like, uh, no, <laughs> no, we cannot use like, uh, in how to say that, um, subversive form and with a content that is politically correct. I hate that. I really like, that makes me go a little angry, you know, like, again, like if it's punk, a punk music with, with a love song, but it's like your, uh, she cheated on me, you know, or he cheated on me in a punk. What? Do you realize how contradictory that is? Like, I don't know. So, so yeah, so really I have no explanation to how, you know, or with whom I, I felt the, all the collaborations were really work of the, the moment. Like, if it's a divine plan, something that is beyond me or them, we were supposed to meet, we were supposed to like each other musically, and then we made music and choo. Zaid Handan, for instance, is one of my greatest encounters. My I, I really love that guy. My, hmm? cousin. my cousin. He's your cousin. Oh, yeah. yeah. He came here. He came paid me a visit with the, the kids <laughs> in February. I know. Because he, does, he really cares about music. He doesn't care about himself. Do you know what I mean? It's not about ego, even though he has his group. And but, like when you hear Zay talking, and then you hear I'm not giving names yet, but when you you hear other guys who just made one song that worked on YouTube, and then they trying to do the same song again and again, inviting some I don't know known singer to have a duo between an underground band and. And you're like, and you hear them talking and you're like, uh, how dare you? Like, you know, three chords, you, you, how dare you talk about music as if you were, uh, like, like you've known it all. And Zaid is very, very humble. It's amazing. Like he yeah, puts so I many artists on the map. Yeah, I mean, for honestly, me, he's the so, father of the electronic scene, yeah. like really of the Arabic electronic scene. He is the godfather of it. It Everything hurts my feeling when like, I hear some guys yeah. being like, I'm the first one who made electronic. Shut up. 
Yeah, I mean, when he did it, first of all, like I was maybe in my early teens, not even 15, and he was mm. making music with Yasmin, Hamda. Yeah. Even their gigs were so underground because it was after the civil war and we didn't really have anywhere, mm. a lot of venues to go and listen yeah. to um, underground music. And it really was a new sound. And now everything sounds like what he was doing back then. A lot of artists are sounding. Yeah. Um, and I'm just really surprised. I'm like, why isn't he getting, you know, the credit? The credit, yeah. But also the coming back to Arabic. I was laughing when you were saying he cheated on me because I do love mm -hmm. a love, an Arabic love song. I do love an yeah. Arabic song. I mean, I'm a crazy romantic. I'm such a romantic. Yeah, yeah. I love love songs and I love Asmahan. I love Kulsum. I cry, you know. Um, yeah, but no, that's another level on Kulsum. <laughs> we're not talking about. <laughs> but like that the... was really a move back towards these songs <laughs> because everybody else was making music in English, right? They were making. Yeah. People were making. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was the years of MTV. And yeah. now coming back to this mix of, as you said, you know, um, electronic music with Arabic, Arabic songs. Yeah. That's something that is from the past two decades, you know, and it's it's beautiful yeah. going on. I, I do agree. And also what I really also love about him is he's fresh. He's always fresh. You know, he's so killed or Hiba, whatever, but he's all he's reinventing himself, but not reinventing himself because it's not he's he's on a, on the real road. He's not stuck. Many artists like they do something that works well and they're stuck there. They just try to change the sound, but not the structure, not the nar narration, not the you know the full sound. They try just to make the sound more up to date. But he's not there at all. He improved himself so much on on many instruments. Like when he came, I was like, really, oh, I remember you, like you know, 2012 actually, yeah. It wasn't it wasn't it you didn't play the same on the ukulele or and I love that. Uh yeah, I love that about Zay. I, I love everything about Zay, really. Yeah, I love him. He puts so many mm. amazing women also on the map. Like for example, Marie yeah. is um such a yeah. inspiration to me. And exactly he he loves to amplify, you know, women's voices. And I want to just talk a little bit about the Arabic love song because oh yeah, <laughs> go. I think they can be they can be punk also in a way, but I know you yeah were, yeah. So you came from a background where at home you were listening to Abdul Halim and all that, but you were also listening uh, to pol very political music. No uh, no no, not I wasn't home. listening to political okay. music. Yeah, at all. Like I didn't like Sheikh Imam. I found it too like too okay. harsh. That was too... later. Yeah, it was later when, I realized, when actually I had that kind of luggage, musicology kind of luggage, to realize that the guy's arrangement wasn't good, the recordings were, weren't good, and uh, but the the compositions is are amazing. He's he's absolutely genius of a composer, Sheikh Imam. But uh, I mean, I was into music for music, not for political at all, like. Like to join this for the love song, what I meant, it's not. I, I do, I make also love songs. I, I, I like real love songs. And when I say, you know, he cheated on me, I don't make a song about he cheated on me. I mean, say it poetically if you want, you know, overcome the, the stuff, you know, don't be in victimization because you also communicate in that energy to whoever's going to listen to that. So they're gonna be in that energy, like Om Kulthum. Do you remember, like Om Kulthum? All her stuff is like, I'm, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. And at the end, is sorry again for the word, fuck you. You know, it's poor. Uh, the words, also the lyrics. You know, that's that's that can be punk, but you know, the songs that are just like going with the with the the, the first emotion that you feel. So it's just, you know, satisfying something that you listen to in just one moment emotion not feeling you know he cheated on me i'm angry by right? for for example you know i'm angry i'm the victim how could he how dare he you know do that to i don't know say he was a i have a song like like that which is an 
a knight, I put my the crown. I realized that I put the crown. It wasn't you. You didn't have a crown on your head. I put. The, I took the crown of my head and I put it on your head. Now I'm taking it back. For me, that was my way to say, "Fuck you, cheating on me." <laughs> Again, too many words, too many punk words. I'm living with a punk. I told you so. On the match, no more. <laughs> But let's talk more about your musical influences because you yeah. you listen to music at home and then you were in a choir at a very young age. Yeah. And you studied musicology. So sort of walk us through all these stages and all the influences you had um, early on. Yeah. When I, when, I, when I was really young, I used to be in a choir also. So we sang a lot of it. And I was a soloist, soloist, among soloists, there were many. Uh, later on, like my own, like for instance, Om Kulthum, I, I didn't like her when I was a kid. Like I found the thing, I liked her very late. But I remember like around 17, that's when, I remember one moment, not 17, at 10, there was Bob Marley on the radio, Could You Be Loved? And I remember I just turned, I was like going round like dervish around myself with my arms like up. I remember that moment. It was upstairs in our house. Uh, and then I started discovering, to be honest, I, I was very uh, enchanted by harmony, actually, by the, what you found, you know, could you be love, that kind of stuff that is joyful, you know. Maybe I had enough of the minor scales of Arabic music, you know. So it was, like, ah, major, and not major like Beethoven major, scary major, you know joyful major and and then like 14 15 i started discovering rock and that was amazing um, pink floyd wait your head led zeppelin a lot of like old actually old bands uh who else like used to really like yeah mainly mainly like really wait your head and pink floyd and then after that there was like led zepp and the doors and all the rest and then uh, like revelations, musical revelations, that was this like rock came at my teenager years. So, and then I was in a rock band and I didn't know there was even like rock musicians. So uh, after two years being by myself, you know, or with my friends, didn't know that there was actually a scene. So when I joined that scene, it was, I was, I don't know, on a, on a cloud all the time for a year, at least for the first year. Uh, then, then jazz, and this choir of uh, choir of uh, classical classical Mwashahat, which was which was like really interesting, really cool, because the people there were really cool. Not what I would have expected. I thought they would be a lot of conservative, like traditionalist people, but they were a lot of them were like me. You know, they were interested in the form, in the aesthetics of something that they know since they were kids, but they don't. They, they don't know their real secrets, so they want to really learn the the, the ground rules or the, really the, in the good form. Um, and yeah, then I discovered jazz, and I wanted to I wanted to to be jazz singer. Uh, and then when I was in musicology, I realized no, because I I went to so many jazz concerts and I didn't like the audience, so I was like, I'm not, I don't want to sing for those. I'm sorry. <laughs> And I realized that my mom, when I put jazz at home, she doesn't like it. So I was like, nah, I come, I'd rather make music that my mom would appreciate at the end, kind of. I don't know how to really express that, but really it was the audience, like really, you know, Paris snobbish people, like really sitting, even if it's, there was like one concert of Michel de Gonchilou, there was so much groove. You can see smoke of marijuana on stage, you know, they go on the right. They were top of their forms, and people like this, sitting and listening, you know, and waiting for the end to. Uh, so yeah, so that was my period, my jazz period. It went like this, and like to 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 tell you something about musicology. Um, for me, it was really something to learn that music is not something that you learn at school. Really, it's a it's an art or science of the ears. You can develop your ear. You can fail at naming what you're hearing, or but if you can do it, it doesn't matter because that's the 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 the, 
the consistency that's that's what we're talking about you know table won't change because you're not take calling it a table if you can use it you can use it this the same goes for notes if you can make notes and can make music it doesn't matter you can call it you can call the scales or call and for me also that was an important moment because when you learn the stuff you learn the jargon and you start analyzing and you know the genre and you know baroque and the difference and the, the les tri and especially you know the, the jargon and then you find yourself with classical musicians and they try kind of to intimidate you because obviously you're arab you're little dark they don't expect you to know but when you know and you see on their faces that they know much less than you because they don't have it, stuff in their ears you for me it was like okay that's it so for me musicology maybe it sounds arrogant but it just taught me one thing that you cannot that you cannot learn music at any school you can learn it with a master ear to go to a master who doesn't know parts or notation but yeah just took out a complex that i had you know around uh academic or music or people who can read you know parts it's super easy it's nothing really and it's like basic math when it comes to writing if you do it even if you like you write it aesthetically beautiful in terms of vision like it's gonna work well also sonically it's amazing hello Badia, uh, from awesome. your beautiful home in Rome. <laughs> Aslima, Aslima. Sabah al khair. Sabah al nour. Nahla ta'adim. Et moi, je suis à Paris. Alors, on va Bahre. continuer notre conversation de, de la dernière fois in English mm -hmm. with uh, some words in Arabic and French. Okay. Because these are the languages we're, we're using. <laughs> yeah. And today, as we continue to witness um, the uh, unhinged massacre of uh, Palestinians, and continued uh, damages of uh, imperialism around the Arab world, specifically, mm -hmm. and around the globe. I want to focus on this question of uh, what is revolutionary music? And this is a topic that you have been really exploring since the beginning of uh, your practice as an activist and an artist. So let's explore the topic of what does it mean to be a revolutionary musician and what does it mean to make revolutionary music? It's kind of an ocean to, to dive in. But uh, like to start, I think it's very important for any artist not to feel like to have to be neutral because now it's like everyone is telling you, you know, not just do your art. Why do you what? Why are you thinking or talking or expressing, uh, including topics of political interest? But for me, as an artist, as a, a human being, my practice is linked to my expression of a human being, of my to my emotions. I mean, like some people would cry at home. I cry and make a song. So it's it's organic. I'm not doing uh, an, it's a special effort to to be an activist it's just it comes naturally and i think it comes naturally to any artist if they are if they are true to themselves if they are yeah just true to themselves they have you have to be an empath you have to be empathetic when you are an artist otherwise you wouldn't feel the emotions of other people so i think it's hypocritical for any artist now being known or uh, or really in the underground scene to ignore what is happening in palestine or in sudan but palestine it's it's a it's a bigger issue because it exposes really the the the, the real world we are living in the real uh, the, the the hypocrisy of the the western world so yeah i think revol revolutionary music is just being yourself actually as an artist is really not being a slave to to capitalism not to imperialism not to not to have uh, those objectives or um, not, not objectives but like those aims those principles of life of competition consumerism also apply to your art if you are if you can make yourself free of that the the question of palestine or 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 talking about any injustice that is even around you at a very small scale is really at the core of your practice as an artist being be it a musician or 
or, or, or um, a painter or a sculptor or a um, cinematographer. So, yeah, I don't know if a uh, little answer the question. <laughs> yeah, for you, for you, did this revolutionary consciousness begin from an experience of oppression, of an experience of, I can't say what I want to say, um, yeah. you know, in Tunisia. Tell me more yeah. about that. <laughs> that was, um, I mean, I, I didn't, first, I, I when you, when I start making music, I was influenced actually by um, 70s rock music. So it, it was more authentic in terms of words. It was more for now. It wasn't only about love stories and, th and conceptual things that are poetic, just poetic things that would take us out from our reality. It was into the reality. And then transposing that to to my environment, to my an Arabic speaking environment, that's how I first wrote the my first songs that came out naturally were like talking about the social reality that was around me, that was social social injustice. And um, knowing that the first movement that was doing that in Tunisia was actually hip hop. The, the, the rap scene was really in true and talking about what, they, what, what was happening. I think that what was like really gave me the first, um, the, I mean, not insight, yeah first insight in, into the world I'm living in. Um, I don't know how to, it wasn't like, I, I don't know if I, I stress it enough. I don't think it's a choice. I will, it wasn't a choice for me. I didn't uh, absolutely, I don't remember at any moment. I thought I'd be writing about this. I'd be writing about what happened to this boy who was killed in Tunisia, you know, because he went out in, in the protest. I just like, I was with my guitar and singing and then his name came and, uh, and I kept, uh, and then I would, you know, like rewrite the words to make it really good. But um, going back to this, this or very organic approach, if you are true to yourself again, <laughs> empathetic. And, uh, and if you're not, if you're not, um, imprisoned uh, by the, the, the general, the, the fear, actually. And being like at, at 17, when I started doing that, and started writing songs, you are always in a, this rebellious thing. So by the age maybe 22, 23, it was more of a, a challenge to, to see also what are the limits? Where are the limits? Is it in our heads? Because, you know, 1984, you know, <laughs> Orwell and all that stuff where the, the, the cop is actually in you. You become some kind of a police. You you think that you shouldn't be talking about this. The sense of paranoia, general paranoia that I, that I remember very well that many of you know, if youth now when they talk about the Tunisian revolution, they don't know. They they, they didn't live the, the the dictatorship in its most, you know, grand, you know, expression, which means if you are in the tram in the metro and in, in a bus, you cannot talk about politics because people are like, you know, you're you're scared that the one person next to you don't like to talk about politics. We, we used to go to have a meeting at some friend's house because he has this interior garden. It, we were in some kind of like really paranoia that the, the walls have have ears. So there was this um, the this movement i wasn't the only one i realized later on that we really were moved by the same thing which was what are the limits what is fear uh is it real you know because when you see the police how dumb they are you 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 feel like i cannot be like ruled or like uh, you know they cannot know what is happening in my head so where is the policeman really? Is it outside or inside of me? And can I just like take it out? And writing more explicitly about politics and really like about giving names or, you know, talking about the family of, of Leila Ben Ali, for instance, or giving the name of Ben Ali was this kind of attempt to see what is the wall or is it really inside of me? Or is it is there really a, an organized security thing to prevent us from being free. And the Tunisian revolution actually proved that there, there wasn't, it was all like propaganda, all like Hollywood, you know, a cinema, it's uh, America is the most, you know, 
the strongest and the moral and and actually it's just cinema. There is nothing of all of that. They're dumb, dumb as f, you know. <laughs> but they work. Well, they they work hard, but they're dumb. That's so interesting. It's pushing pushing the limits to the extreme to sort of test yeah. to test the grounds of free free speech. Exactly. Uh, but I want to take us back to the point you said earlier about, you know, rebelling, the, your mm -hmm. initial sort of experiences of, of rebelling. Mm -hmm. And if you could name also personally, you know, what were you rebelling against? Uh, what limitations did you feel you had on your, you know, your movement in your life and how you wanted um, to live, to think and, and so on? I could. The first, like, really, it wasn't political. It was my condition as a as a girl, as a woman. It really, like, I, I remember being, like, really super angry and always doing, like, I started smoking just out of spite, like, to to be, to be, I, I used to go to my rehearsal from the high school to, to the rehearsal place with one cigarette after another. And I, I did it with them like this, you know. It was really just, uh, because girls do not smoke in, in the streets, you know, they do not smoke outside girls can be touched in the metro and you and you shouldn't be talking you shouldn't talk about it you shouldn't even like address the issue or talk to the guy or be aggressive because that's uh, that says a, a bad things about you you know like how could you you know and i i remember being in that frame of mind where no you know it was like always no from like 15 when i was 15 years old like remember a, a guy i i i ran after him it was Super amazing. Like you went out from the metro and I was like, I catch you not small. I don't know why he ran out. <laughs> he was running away. Those little things, I think that uh, shaped, um, that was like the first, first like things I, I, I was rebelling against and, and with a very conscious mind, me and another friend. And I think that little window, I mean, of, of freedom, like kept going bigger and bigger like when you intersectionally you realize that you are the oppressed in very oppressed you know a society maybe guys are freer than you but they're not that free once you get to that level or like, you don't care and you impose and you do what you want and you realize it's just in your head also you know we used to like how to say that like more maybe because people weren't expecting it so when you take really your your space, this normal space for any human being, not the space that you are allowed to take as a, just a girl. Maybe you startle them. Maybe it's like just a surprise. But the reaction is not, uh, is not <clears throat> angry or, you know what I mean. Like once, yeah, once once a guy punched me in the face, but I get I, <laughs> that was the one time. But yeah, I hurt him too. I'm sure you did. <laughs> Music, musically, what does that sound like? That that you know that rage, that anger at you know that you know I about that in, feeling. Yeah, musically, in your music, in what did you want it to sound like? I was in a rock band, so it sounds really like, and it used to be like really provocative. I remember like one gig there was police, and the police wanted to come up stage because just because I kept putting like the mic stand be between my legs and playing like sexually about it, you know. It wasn't my intention wasn't seductive. It was really provocative. I was wearing a very short skirt, you know, really rock, black, or and and I was playing with that limit. My I, I know very well that I was talking to girls, not to boys, for me, you know, and, and the, the police, they wanted to come upstage and then they were like behind and and ended up being a lot more provocative because my bass player was started doing like you know really weird movement on on the bass and the police guy like went completely crazy and wanted to start to stop the show, but he didn't stop. Anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think I lost myself in the, in my ideas. Yeah, about the sound yeah. also, you know, um, about the sound of the music, the lyrics. <laughs> Um, themselves yep. and it's so interesting how music has the power to provoke also so much rage from um police you know from police from governments mm -mm. from uh you know legal establishments you know you mean, uh, you mean how they feel threatened by it yes yeah, yeah. it's amazing huh so it's like just something that you cannot touch it's not much actually but maybe that is why also 
I think um, maybe they know from books that it's very it's very important in shape and minds and when you are young, you know, young and free, free hearts. And so it happened to me that or it shaped, I mean, the music I was listening to when I started understanding lyrics, like in, in, in English, I was so super happy, like in, in for instance, Bob Marley or stuff like that, you know, the stuff that is can be frontal, you know, like freedom being uh, a, a frontal request, not, not to, like, as I said earlier, not a poetic thing to, to be playing around, like for, for instance, not conceptually like Pink Floyd, which was also, you know, very, uh, very subversive as music for that, for that time. Mm. So yeah, I, 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 I think that they were right of feeling threatened by it. But uh, the more you react, the more the the movement amplifies when when it concerns youngsters. And that's something that maybe they didn't understand because I think it's the underground scene that I lived in that gave actually the revolutionary adults that made the revolution. Mm, I mean, the ones who are between 20 and 30, I mean, that that the underground scene that started having having the police eyes and repression on like the hip hop movement and the rock movement that start uh, playing our own songs in, in Arabic, you know, playing compositions, not just covers uh, in English who police that do not understand. So, uh, yeah, I think they were right. <laughs> mm, propaganda needs to, to, to shut down the, the voices, the dissident voices, because they have the power to shape and influence much more. In, in one concert, you can touch hundreds of people. So, yeah. You said dissident or dissonant voices? And also, it's, I mean... Uh, sorry, I didn't. Dissident. Because... Do we say that? Dissident. Dissident. Yes, 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 definitely. Dissident. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean... I love that uh, word. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <Me too>. Very, <laughs> very interesting because I'm I'm trying to get to also how uh, all these influences came together for you. So you have rock, sort of like mm -hmm. punk rock. You have, you know, reggae, Bob Marley, and, and that, and of course, you're in North Africa, and then you have Arabic music, Arabic lyrics. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about how you started thinking about shaping a uh, revolutionary sound that was rooted in the site, you know, the place that you were in. Um. The, I think that came, I remember the, the exact moment of revelation, actually, about that. It's... Uh, it's when you realize that really your first political choice or life choice, actually, not even like how you want to live, is it's also choosing the culture that you want to maintain or preserve. What 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 are the 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 yeah the 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 foundations? Culture is is in, let's say if 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 culture is a sum of principles and foundations and ways a savoir vivre. I don't know like. Uh, how to live your life, which culture you want to pass to. Yeah, so I think that that that's the moment where is, you know, when you realize that you come from colonized country and that there is a lot of subtle colonization still going on, culturally spe specifically, uh, mental colonization where you always feel like you are lesser than a French person or so once you realize that, you know, like that's what actually they even teach you at school. Why are we called the third world? How, like Yusuf Shaheen was saying that, well, how on earth me with like Tunisia, we have uh, traces, runes of 7,000 years of civilization are we called the third world or Egypt or Lebanon or, you know, compared to England or France or, I mean, I realized that even later on, like with the music, that yeah, that all, all that history of of my history that was kind of hidden from me, and and so the choice was, uh, I started being like, even though I write in English or even in French some songs, but I've never released them, and for me it's like uh, like to have a connection. I thought I want to sing to my people kind of, of this this youth that is listening to 
other other artists that talk to them really, but in other language. So it's not really the same context. And I wasn't the only one you can see. I mean, like the, there was this awakening, actually, this renaissance in in the Arab world. And I, maybe it was linked to the fact that we, the, the first generations that didn't live under any kind of colonization, like my dad still remember the French soldiers, you know? Not me, I only know the cops. Maybe there was transmitted also that kind of uh, of treatment, you know, like the, the 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 first police. I mean, the police in Tunisia, sometimes you feel like they still behaving as if they, uh, they were colonizer. They were the army of a colonizer, not, not your own police, you know? You're, you're our friends, you're supposed to protect me. But yeah, so the, 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 the choice uh, was clear. I mean, musically, I consider, uh, I mean, this is for the lyrics, huh? for like singing in Arabic or in English, or because for the format where I was doing, it it come at least uh, apparently for the last decades or hundred years, we think that is Western music. But when you go and, and look a little, you realize that it's African music, like harmony or stuff like that, that all came actually from Africa. And so from that regard, I, in terms of lyrics, I wanted to talk to my people. I wanted to, to, to pass also my emotions in my own language, which was completely, absolutely different. I was telling you it comes out organically. You don't have to think about, you know, what word to use. It comes out. And in terms of music, I left that more freely. I, uh, I thought, like, in terms of arrangement, uh, I don't feel like I'm using the the heritage of another culture i consider that the heritage of all humanity is mine it always when you also studied musicology and musicology is talking about all those movements that there would there would mm, there would be no evolution in music we would be still at monotonous thing if there was not uh, this movement uh, and and influences from other culture and people you know like trying when they, they, they have those little sentences and then they play it their own way and they change through generations and they become this tra new traditional music of that country. And at the very beginning, it was coming from somewhere else. Uh, and so that, to, to say that I consider all human musical heritage as mine, and uh, I realized that my in my voice, my voice, there will be my my identity, whether I like it or not. I have that the, the voice from Kev. So I think that was sufficient to either in melodies or in just sometimes just the sound, you know, and singing in Arabic. Plus I know that I grew up listening to my grandma singing. So I have that here, like, you know. Um, so yeah, so it's a mix of, of choices and letting go of, of like, you know, trying to cadre to uh, yeah to have a frame to, to, yeah yes. uh so well, because i was also thinking um you know a lot of music genres that people think of uh ignorantly as western are african more recently yeah. i mean rock music dub music which influences you a lot dub comes yeah, from yeah, jamaica yeah. Yeah. Um, rock comes from blues. It comes from so it's specifically the experience of the enslaved Africans who were brought to the New World and created resistance music, dissident yep. um, revolutionary rhythms. It's specifically thinking about rhythms. Electronic music came from um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this culture as well. Absolutely. So how do you oh, think about how do you have this conversation yeah, well. with these rhythms? Yeah. What? Yeah, Sorry? because we what have those rhythms. Uh, oh, we have those rhythms in um, in our music too. Specifically in North Africa, you have many ecstatic yeah. drum yeah. patterns. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I know yeah. That's absolutely. You explore as well. Mm -mm. Yeah, um, North Africa is Africa, and I realized like uh, I played some, at some point when I was student in 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 France. I I bought a djembe and I, I used to go to to you know like the gathering circles, percussion circles with really like African guys. So you have like, sorry for the, the term, but you have sometimes like those white circles where it's a little bit chaotic, but I mean like organized and chaotic, it's weird. And uh, uh, on the other hand, if you get accepted by the African guys, it's not about actually capacity, it's about capabilities, it's about respect. 
you don't come and because you have a jambe and you do solo, for instance. No, it's not. That's not how it happens. You come and you learn. You know. So I used to come and sit until one tell me come play this, and they they showed me. Why am I telling you about this? Ah, to tell you that yeah, I realized that, that at that point that we had a lot of rhythms, Tunisian rhythm that were actually small sentences of like bits of longer sentences in that come from African percussive tra traditional percussions, meaning that uh, like for, for, I mean, North Africa or Arabic or even uh, the white word or whatever, we consider the, 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 the rhythm cell as being like really small and, and it's groove. But we, in Africa, that's also what I learned in ethnomusicology is that it's a language. So when you're the center, it could be even a paragraph, it could be a big text, you know, it could be telling the history of your family with uh, with a piece of percussions. So, well, I, I mean, I think that was inherently there, it reminded us, but we can't, it, it was sous jacent <laughs> in, the, in the North African culture. We have this connection to really do that we forgot, forget sometimes, most of us forget, but you can find it technically and theoretically to African rhythm and sense and then the connection with the ground and with your heart because and with the sun because the sun is like is vibrating in rhythm that also i saw in the documentary it was amazing it's really vibrating in rhythm your heart is is having this uh what we call cellula uh, sicilian which is like a pointe, the do the do and that is the foundation of ternary rhythms in generally so that's the groove when it's not like it's not tab 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 it's the tab, the tab, the tab, the tab. that's when you start grooving actually so the three so in Tunisia we are really three like all rhythms they have we have this groove you, you say to a little boy to just play something on 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 the table he would start to the gedum the gedum the gedum so yeah um. I mean, I I think that all human beings should be should be connected to that because it's therapeutic. Therapeutic, the way you say that, it's something that. I mean, for me, like for instance, dancing is the African yoga. I think it, it's more, you know, it's not in the it's not it's not in the control. It's more in the loss of control, and I like that. And I'm I, I like that uh, that perception or that conceptualization. Um, I hope it it gets contagious to the whole world because actually I think also that what what free us part of of freedom is that is is also like getting to lose yourself so you know what freedom is when you let actually starting by the judgment of others on you dancing for instance you know not doing. Um, yeah, these are all forms of knowledge. These are all forms of wisdom and knowledge and yeah. also of relation. These are forms of relation between culture, bodies, people uh, with the yeah. land, relation with the yeah. land. That's so beautiful. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you specifically about Sufi music because and mm. Zad, because I'm really obsessed by any sort of <laughs> mystical mystical tra ecstatic tradition. And I know yeah. you've been exploring that too. So yeah. tell me a little more about the yeah the voice and the and the drum in the, in these traditions you've been exploring. Like like you said exactly like the the, the it's the the foundations of all like this the, the, the what we call like trance movements at the end you know for in in trance music it's in in uh, organically in those very instinctive or yeah organic organic cultures when. I'm not talking about it before electronic music, you realize it's really voice and drums. And like just so you know, like the 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 vocal instrument is the one instrument that actually have all the specific specificities of, of other instruments, which means it has strings, it has it, when you're using your voice, you're using strings, the chords, you're using air to the sound, and you use it also percussive because you do the strings go. So that's the three types of musical instruments in one. And I think that, um, uh, why am I saying this? Uh, 
Yeah, so at the very, very beginning, like in family gathering or whatever, you have no other instrument but percuss percussions and 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 vocals. And even when if it's not like uh, religious or spirit, I mean, like spiritual or m m mystique or, you know, like or gathering for for a saint or Willy, generally you, you always have this kind of trance. And sometimes it's even... Um, activated by certain rhythms and i'm gonna be back to this to the ternary rhythms you know the, these are the, the the rhythms that gets you into a trance that it can be controlled if you control the tempo if you go like do, 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 da, 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 like that that's when you lose a little bit of which means that they liberate your consciousness of being in the present and trying to control and once you so that um how to say that learning an apprentissage, <laughs> a way of learning to let go of certain things to actually be able to communicate with the divine or actually with yourself, with the divine part of yourself, which is a free, a free part that is capable of every everything that comes, no limitations actually. Uh, in Tunisia, they we have like the Sufi. There are so many diff many turok, many methods, Sufi movements. A, a big uh, majority of them would be like the Bandir and you know the the Muslim, and in those there is a little bit of trance. Like trance is not, it's not actually a state uh, you should enjoy. It's a state uh, that is needed for some people when they have problems, actually, and it has to come out. It's like they're taking the evil or whatever out. And so they let you get to that state and some uh, uh, to, to take out something, to, to, yeah, to get rid of something. There is one movement, Aisawiya, which went actually more lengths, which is like uh, you, you can use fire when you get into that state, you you... you eat fire or like with sabers or and then you have the stambeli movement which me i'm um, i'm much more uh, keen on that like it really talked to me because first it's really linked very directly to africa uh it's very clearly with an african identity i mean it was it is a movement musical movement or movement in general, like spiritual movement within the black community in Tunisia. Black community with the uh, afterwards, you know, like it it expanded. And the second, the trance is really controlled and it's very well looked on. It's actually, you know, it's uh, it's good to get in into that state, but you don't lose like control. The rhythms are not like just uh, what I like, it's like, uh, what I really love about it, it's th that they, they have a complexity. When you dance to it, for instance, me, what I love is you feel like you are dancing in the sea. It's like a wave, you know, there is this kind of polymetry, we call it. So the tempo kind of, it's not all, it expands a little, you know. So you have, an, and you have songs that are really linked to elements, like stuff that you would find in Cuba, you know, like music about Orishas or, so when, they talk about saints. They, you realize afterwards that they are linked to elements. So, Baba Bahari, Bahari, you know, Baba Bahari. That's a part. So we're talking about, you know, like spirit of the the water. And 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 if you pay attention, the rhythm is really, is really wave, wave C. Even though, like I said before, I found that in all of that music. But sometimes it's just how you move. You cannot be in a in a, you cannot you know you cannot get into a, a locked state of trance. You, you're not as I said you're not moving just like this. You have to to be. You know always the, your the rhythm is taking you through little cadences. I don't know how to explain it. I'm sorry if it's a little vague. But no, I mean, it's very that, clear. Yeah, oh, cool. like the, I love the, it. <laughs> The, uh, the the pulsation is not just one. It takes you through different uh, different waves, different uh, yeah, different jumps that makes you go into a very joyful kind of trance. That's what I meant. Like you lose the, but you lose it with finesse, little by little, even though it feels like really uh, very earthly and uh, kind of um, yeah, very organic, very earthly, very. Uh, 
brute, very wild kind of, you know, activity. Actually, it has a very fine, sophisticated thing that is at the core of it. That that's why I'm really fascinated by the Stambeli music. It comes from in the instruments uh, that are playing some kind of a, a bass that goes back to percussion. So you have percussion and this the dun 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 a, a bass that's also playing a rhythm. And then you have the that always go, you know, they are always on the six eight signature, so always like really ternary, but not the three four that would make you lose yourself that you can find in other musical movement in in, in Tunisia. So if you that's like three four and you can lose it quickly you have always something to 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 stand on you know to the re jump higher and you come back and you re jump higher so i don't know if that's you, so I, amazing never really talked about it methodically <laughs> i love it we're getting a, a beautiful Ooh. lesson uh i you know the topic of my thesis has been dissonance uh, yeah. But when oh, I started, cool. when I started interviewing, so I'm not a musicologist, and when I started interviewing uh, musicologists and musicians who are not Western, yeah, they don't like the word dissonance because they think dissonance, and really etymologically, dissonance is a Western word that means okay. um, unpleasant sound, okay. a sound that doesn't go, that doesn't, that is, uh, oh, that is yeah. out of tune, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But what you're describing really is dissonance because you're <laughs> sort of going from one state to another. There is no right. strict um, structure or form or frame for yeah. right. the cultural experience. So how do you feel about this word dissonance and how can we reclaim it? Exactly. I think that we should reclaim it. Okay. <laughs> because, I mean, all the, the, all the, actually even the modern music, like uh, blues, jazz, Everything that gave now the pop music, the the rock music, funk, house, techno, all that, because some black musicians, like I'm talking like 19th century, started playing dissonant music. Like if you think uh, the album that changed the face of jazz, which came quite late, like I'm I'm considering like giant steps of of Coltrane. I mean, giant steps is absolutely all wrong. The the in for the, it's really like the dissonance. Like if you think about what the Nazi called jazz music, they call it the de, de, degenerance, the musique degenere, degenere. So it's like the music uh, losing its consonance, which is divine, you know, like if you don't have the fourth and the fifth, like, you know, you can't hear them and, it, and a minor, you know, like third or a major to express the majestuosity or, you know, that's the end of the word. No. So the, the the foundation of, of jazz was actually expressing di dissidence by dissonance. Every time the, 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 the movement, the, the music was reclaimed because they couldn't play like big stages or record. So white musicians would really like steal the, the, the music that was being played all around America, but in only in, in Negro clubs. That's how they called them, yeah. And they play them for, I mean, all the music of Elvis Presley, you know, you, you know, it's all black music that was stolen. And every time that happens, jazz musicians make new, like break more rules to like follow me until they got to free jazz, you know, where it's like, just <laughs> if you don't have it here, <laughs> forget about it. You won't get it. You cannot like learn it like now, you know, you go to school in Sweden to to learn free jazz. That's not possible. It's not possible. You have to know that. It's not possible. Here, here. So, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, this, you know, we have to own it, you know, it's like the, 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 the gay movement, you know, you reclaim things, reclaim what, what is kind of pejorative to, to, be in, to be in what it is. The aesthetics are not defined by one culture to the whole world, that ethnocentricity era is gone, and it didn't. It didn't last long, but there was so much written around it that we have the feeling that it's been like this for hundreds of years or 
thousands of years. It just it went all just through the colonization and they rewrote the history and we forgot that the invention of the meter is actually from the pyramids and and you know in the hour it's all coming from more not to not to say that all oh, the Western culture is but they they took so much from other cultures and they call it Western and when it's there is problems in this world like in terms of ecology, the human being uh, is killing Mother Earth. But the Western man invented planes, you know? It's either we are both in it for winning or, and, and loss, or let's really find who did what. Because, in the, <laughs> because from that point of view, the third world would be what we, we think it is. Well, you know, the, the actual dissonance in the region is created by Western colonialism. I mean, if oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I started we'll thinking about just the sounds of war, the sounds of war, mm -mm. the ecological reality of living under bombs, under the yeah. bombs, yeah. Um, of not having homes, of having landscapes completely burned and destroyed. So yeah. that's created by Western imperialism. I mean, it's billions and billions of dollars spent yeah. um, on destroying people and landscapes. Um, yeah. So... My thinking about dissonance came from that. It's how do we echo, how do we sort of echo, channel, and exercise? You used the word exercise, or you used the yeah. idea of exercising spiritual, re removing the evil. Yeah. So musically, how can we sort of take that noise and then reclaim it, but also transform it into something that you said is could be healing, could be, conf you know, confronting dissident, can be can be cleansing? I, I think the first step is actually to recognize it even, I mean, like musically and to express it as it is. And from that point of of the, of the insight, uh, that's how I super, like I, I have a lot of consideration and respect for the work of Camilla Jobran now, because I think she is expressing that. She's expressing, you know, the dissonance, the disruption also that is happening in, in 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 the Arabic Arabic region, or anyway, the, the the South or Third World, the reawakening of the imperialism to try to get <clears throat> no, we're not going away. So I think it's a very hard exercise to uh, be to be truthful and get out of the spectrum of you know the normal feelings and emotions that we are taught to to express as musicians. You know, like just sadness or or love or longing or uh, joy. It's it, those the, the the what you are talking about the dissonance, the ecological impact, the uh, um, imagining actually even like a tree waiting for you know because tree trees wail you know and earth being absolutely not. Uh, it reminds me of what the Romans you know did in Carthage you know a long time ago you know to take burn all trees, put salt, you know, that's exactly what now, for instance, Israel is doing in Gaza and trying to do even in West Bank and has been doing for 70 more plus years, you know, the, the kind of disrespect that they have for olive trees, just to name one. So, yeah, I think that it's to have the audacity and, and the and the technical, actually, luggage to, to, to be, and the emotional transparency to be able to express this. And I think it's a very hard exercise. I've done some, me when from like COVID, COVID period, like the feelings and honestly, like people when they listen to it and they're like, uh, 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 you know, that I know that uh, at the end, I mean, one friend told me that from the Cité Internationale that actually the, she was the one that, uh, um, felt like she understood my emotion. So she was, yeah, it, 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 um, it expressed how we felt that moment, which, which was for me, for instance, a silent pain, kind of, you don't feel, you cannot really express it. Everyone is living the same. So you, 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 you cannot go to a friend and be like, oh, I'm not feeling good today. We are not feeling good, all of us, you know, <laughs> we're all scared for our loved ones. We, and we cannot uh, express it. So that was like that silent pain talking about another yeah, kind of emotion or that's what I experienced myself. And I know that that was a hard exercise, but and that's why also I have a lot of respect to the work of Camille Jovran, for instance, 
because I believe once you get to first express it, then you can get to the healing part. It's like blues. Blues, you have to, you know, when you start the, 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 if you don't feel like it reminds you that moment when you are really down and low and, you know, nobody's thinking about you and you're alone, he's going to bring you to that. But when the, at the end of, you know, at the end of the, of the song or the piece, that's when you feel like, it's like it went with the sound, you know, a, a part of your pain actually left your body or your, your soul when the music went out from your head, your ears, your body. So I think, yeah, to, to get to the healing, you have to be able first to express and have the courage to express it and not be in the normal, you know, like the, the frames, the, the, the boxes of how to make music and the harmony that would touch people and what would work in the musical industry. And it's, uh, and it's hard huh, for musicians now, you know, it's hard. <laughs> Let's get back to revolutionary music. Uh, you know, the Arab uprisings have uh, risen and unfortunately fallen in so many yeah. ways, even though a lot has changed, for example, yeah. in terms of, I think, even though, for example, women's rights and gay rights uh, are still, uh, you know, being battered. You know, we're talking, uh, of course, there's a lot of racism within mm -hmm. the Arab world. You mentioned, for example, Black T Tunisians. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, racism against migrant work workers. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of colorism. I mean, there are so many issues uh, between classes, between religious communities, between... Uh, um, and so, you know, violence against women. However, consciousness has changed. I, I think conscious, the con you know, we're talking, there's so many artists like yourself, there are more women artists, yes. There is a change of consciousness. There are more artists like yourself, more women artists, more queer artists, writers, intellectuals, even some politicians in the region. Um, and during the, the uprising, there were many, many people at the front lines of, uh, you know, the movement on the street, uh, saying incredible, uh, sharing incredible ideas and art. So how do you feel about the legacy of the Arab uprisings? Uh, I think that maybe we were, uh, obviously we were expecting much more. I mean, I was expecting like a, a Latin American, you know, revolution where like the youth would take power kind of, you know I mean? In the old sense, they're still fighting. In Latin America, they get, you know, they get the revolution, and then the America comes back and try to put someone again in power. I think also that it's exactly what will be happening in Egypt and in Tunisia, for instance. Syria, it's a bigger problem that I think it's actually even too hard for me to understand. But uh, when for me, Tunisia and Egypt, uh, they couldn't let let us have. <laughs> have they couldn't I mean Egypt by its proximity to Israel and the the role and it's bigger you know like it's huge status uh both culturally you know historically you know the, 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 it's the land of the pyramids the, the the ancient civilization that we just starting to realize how far it is you know it's not just like the four year four thousand that they're talking about Tunisia also it's kind of you know an example that would would disbalance all uh, all power, you know, equilibrium power relationships between Europe and and those countries. So I think it wasn't it wasn't actually from within. We 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 both Tunisia and Egypt have been <clears throat> a victim of of really Western uh, Western influence, like economical terror, for instance, you know, with with the, the, the International Monetary Fund, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the private investors, you know, that, that have money in there, that they were, there was a war, actually, since the revolution, there was a war of not letting, uh, of, of not actually giving the real independence, it, a war to keep those countries under still under, still just as uh, working hands, be not because for these countries in particular, but because also for the impact, even like the, 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 the psychological impact on, on the rest of the oppressed world or the, the world under the, the, the Western imperialist influence. So from that perspective, I think we still, 
have gone a long way because now the, what I see from like my sister or uh, you know like young friends who didn't they did not know the, the dictatorship what was before the revolution they have no ideas no idea you know like the the there are actually some set of, of freedom of speech that is it, it feels now politically it's like going very bad in Tunisia in terms of you know for journalists and but let's talk about from a social point of view there was a lot of taboo that been broken coming from that that freedom of speech and including like talking about either sexual minorities or like you know the the, the feminists um, issue you know like Mm. Egypt is in a in a in a bad rush though. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like the situation in Egypt is much worse than Tunisia. But um, yeah, um, uh, how to say that? From the beginning, I, I I like to be honest. Like to start, I don't believe in in like in in, in revolution as I think it's an evolution and that was just the climax of it. That was like the moment the where something has to be broken so the evolution can continue so it can't be like a moment of big disruptions tak 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 you know still i think there is a, a, a slower evolution that we what we would have hoped for but it still is there i mean in the now in tunisian society little by little people are getting really used with to to the to the clear and uh, confident presence of gay being gay, you know, and you know what I mean? Even though it was like conflictual at the beginning, I would think, oh, there will be, when you compare it to the situation in Morocco, for instance, in Morocco, people have been uh, seen like videos or heard about incidents where homosexuals got assaulted, you know, in the streets or that, uh, there wasn't stuff like that in Tunisia or maybe, but not like, not the, the, the kind of, aggression and how it felt like talking about it even with with the what we say like normal people meaning mean heterosexual normative uh, lower class people going from yeah but you know god and then god will be angry with us too laughing at it you know like uh, yeah but you think uh, oh yeah but uh, they will be kissing in the street you know i had that conversation with with a taxi man for instance this is i i think so it was like, yeah, but when we go, uh, it started with, yeah, homosexual and the association, whatever they they founded an association. I was like, what, what are you scared of? Are you heterosexual? I said, he said, yeah. I said, so there'll be more girls for you. you. I mean, like, think about it like that. And so I was laughing a little. And then he was like, yeah, but then we were going to see, like, guys kissing in the streets and girls kissing in the street. And I was like, because now you see girls and boys kissing in the street, like heterosexual couple. Are we at that stage already? Like, so, and I remember we just looked at each other in the mirror, you know, and we burst laughing for like five minutes. You know, it's not, that's not, it, it has become a much lighter thing. So it's not taboo anymore. You know what I mean? I had a talk with my family at some point, for instance, because I wanted to invite a gay friend home. And so I talked to my parents and I was like, you know, he's a little different, but please don't mention it. And, you know, and they understood my dad smiled. I wouldn't have expected that from my dad, you know. I, I was a little because he's openly gay. You can, you know, he's like in the crazy, you know, crazy gay, and it really it went very well. Um, so from that point of view, that's what I'm saying is like a slow evolution. I would have loved if we can just like go and we all love each other, you know, and nobody think about the color also. You, but we have to address these issues breaking the taboos, having those kinds of conflicts, having the conversation. And then when you talk also, you know, and the, the people would little by little, just the fact that talk you talk about it is going to break a lot of animosity and aggressivity. So from that point of view, there's a lot has a lot of road has been made in now for, in Again, like in high schools or stuff, you can find in Tunisia, you can find guys or girls who are openly gay at a very young age, which is amazing. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, so, yeah, so much has, you know, you know, social media, so much has brought 
But again, again, the people on the ground, the activists mm -hmm. on the ground, the artists on the ground, the writers, the poets, talking about this, like you said. And I love your idea of it's not one big disruption. And I want to propose that it's ongoing disruptions. It's yeah. just, you know, and Sarah Ahmed, the, the queer um, philosopher that I, whose ideas I work with, she talked about being a feminist um, killjoy. And she talked about, you know, for example, being at the dinner table and whenever, you know, your father says something sexist, you stop yeah. him. Yeah. Um, and we were not raised to do that. We were raised to smile, mm -hmm. uh, change the topic, uh, you know, and so on. And to, to stop it and to stop it when it happens, when it, when there's okay. sexual aggression, to stop it and to address mm -hmm. it. And if we train ourselves to do that, and as you said, confront the cop in our heads as well, yeah. um, I think it, it, can, it can, you know, help with change. And my last question for you is, you know, where, you know, today, where do you stand as a revolutionary um, musician? You've been making music for two decades. I will not yeah. share your, your age because you're <laughs> aging so beautifully and gracefully. You. Um, and you're still <laughs> active. You're working on an album right now. Um, so I want to I want to hear how you you thought how your ideas about music have um, sort of changed with all these incredible events that you've experienced. Um, I feel the change, but I have no control on it. It's either, I mean, like it's either what's happening around and also what is happening within me. So um, I, don't, I wouldn't be able really to, like for, for a long time, some critique for my music, like for it to be a little more listenable too. like a friend was like, just, you know, like have your thing, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. And I was like, I don't know, what do you mean? You wanted to mutilate the, the, the things, like take the uh, intro, take the, the little part in the middle that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling a story. That's me, that's it. Um, so I'm appreciating, I'm much more at ease with my weird, and I think Kahru Musiqa was, gave me a lot of confidence to that because I consider it to be a little bit, a lot of doodling around, you know, and. Uh, and being more actually comfortable in being myself when I'm playing, when I'm playing, uh, when I'm programming all the music, than when I give when I give the compositions and give parts to other musicians to interpret. So I so there is my more dissonance or there is more weird things happening. Um, um, so I think that I've already like uh, interiorized that, and now I I feel like this evolution or change. Uh, but I don't know how to say it, like, for instance, the Oblongins, for, in, for example, that is not released yet, but there is like this small video on, on internet. And for me, that's, that, that song is kind of marking something. It's, it's a moment of, of change in composition and in arrangement. And I love that. And I'm go, it feels like I'm going that way. It's like as, as if I took some kind of, you know, I had a lot of roads and I took that road and um, I think, yeah, I'm going back what, where I was in, in electronic music, where it's like, like Herman Hesse said, you know, said, you know the pearls of, of uh, like sound or notes as being pearls of, of glass. So I like being really on the details and not being uh, that, accepting myself of being like really playing on some, the, the harmony that changed slightly, changing just one note on one chord and and let it resonate or suggest in harmony. Like I used to think in when I was 17 or, you know, 18, like I, I wanted to make the music that is not obviously clear, you know, like this is an A, this is a C, B. <laughs> so I think the, the revolution and all that I've lived and, and the travels and the beautiful people that I met also, like that's big, a huge part of it. Like really, when you when you realize that the, your tribe has no nationality, has no that you are much more, much more uh, numerous, or yeah, there is than what we tend to think. We think like that we are the in, in, uh, misunderstood kind of you know people, but no, at all. It's actually the opposite. There are some entities that are trying to impose in the same frame of imperialism of colonialism certain boxes of how music should be done and now they got to the knowledge also of vibration and frequency so playing also with what how you feel in your 
body with bass movement, not just your ears. And you have to have some kind of resistance in, in, in that as being still be able to use those tools, but for, for good, for the good, not being able to recognize yourself as a soldier of love. And I want to, um, yeah, Shadi, I'm a soldier of love and I want to be a soldier of love and I want to to really just like, uh, I don't know how to say that, but uh, suggest or like make flowers, you know, coming out of people people's hearts every time, you know, through my music or, or even when mixing, you know that and you DJ and you see it, you know, and you see like you can also have that kind of therapeutic you know thing in your hands and you can you can see sometimes some person that you feel that they are a little sad so you have to put something that is emotional to get them into on the dance floor you know and express themselves and when you when you see on an evening the change it's it's a, an amazing an amazing feeling it's much better than than owning a castle i think you are, you are a soldier of love, my dear. Oh, cool. Thank you, you too, so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, you know, I think the best part of this project is really all these conversations I'm having with musicians um, cool. all over in their, in their, on their bed, in their living room, in their garden, <laughs> all over the Arab world and, and, you know, in Europe as we live in exile and, and still connect yeah. with our, our roots. And that part is so incredible to me. So I thank you. Cool. Uh, much love. Bye. You too. You too. And, uh, and to be continued. Yes, baby. Yalla.